doing? All right, I'm wrapping up season two of this podcast. Um, I am. I will be back doing more of this, uh, but I'm going to take a little break here. Sometime around the beginning of September, I will be starting my recording class online. It's called Drum Recording Expert. You can find details about it uh, on my website, BlairSinta.com. Um, it's a six-week recording class, two, uh, six classes, two-hour sessions each class. It starts with picking drums and cymbals at the beginning, and we finish with, uh, you know, business stuff at the end. So, top to bottom. Um, I'm going to run that in the fall. Uh, it's going to be pretty limited class size, so if you're interested, head to my website and check that out. And uh, as always, please share anything you can about this uh, podcast. And just help, you know, help it grow and uh, keep going. All right. This was definitely fun. I got to talk to a lot of people that I didn't know this season. That's one of the fun things I find uh, pretty rewarding about this whole thing is just meeting new people. So, yep. Onward and upward. See you guys soon. Bye. And I didn't ask for credit on the records. I didn't right. care. Right. I mean, some of them I did. They gave me, but I I don't care. I just want I just want the bands to be successful and... and you know, have a, have a good journey. And I want the drummer, if he's not going to play on the record, I don't want him sulking in the corner. I want I want him to right. pay attention. And it's like, so next record, right. you are going to be playing drums on it. Yeah. Cause we all know that like that happens to everybody at some point yeah. you get replaced whether. And it's a bad feeling. It's, it's heartbreaking. Yeah. And you know, it's like the first record you've been playing all over, you know, the songs and you're not playing on the record. Yeah. Did you have that experience with not with wire train at all, but like, did you have that experience early on with anything? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The only reason why I'm, I'm still, this is my opinion that I'm still getting to do this is somewhere along the way. I've been the hook, you know, you've got to be, you, you have to be the hook for the records. Like I don't, nobody knows nobody knows me because of chops i don't have any fucking chops i mean i can play shit that's relative to the song and i and i try to come up with things that are interesting right you know and 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 often along the way people have wound up mimicking what i've done but i don't i'm not like i don't have any facility the, the way that most drummers do. I, I have a knowledge for what, what the song needs to be and how to build a song. And I'm just trying to be a hook. I'm like, you mean like that Pantera sound? Not that I'm ever really right. ever asked to get that, but I'm like, you mean that thing? Like that's like the harshest, craziest, fucking weirdest drum sound ever. Yeah, that was the original. I feel like every other kick drum sound before then was still some degree of normal. <laughs> right <laughs> that's just an ambassador with no front head and a bunch of blankets right that right. makes sense but you're right. like what the hell was that yeah so and i do know was it a silver dollar duct tape to a power stroke three okay with uh 414 on figure eight in the middle of the kick drum no shit really yeah, yeah. oh bam you just dropped some gold dude uh, Far Beyond Driven was recorded here, so I feel like uh, somebody who was there told me that. Actually, my head is like, can I see that drill bit? <laughs> like, I want Oh. Because <laughs> you're making me think. It's right here, man. Wow. A... So you just keep it loaded up, the battery, and like, you just... Yeah, it's just the Evans drill bit. Okay. And this sucker... <clears throat> I'm going to tell you what I've been doing recently. This is a... Who makes this thing? Black & Decker... Okay. Lithium. Okay. 20 max volts. So I set it on one, which okay. is the lowest setting. Yep. I mean, I get it. I get the head on finger tight and then I just go around gradually until, because when this thing hits a certain tension, it won't tighten anymore at that level. And I found. The, 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 the bit? It, <clears throat> the bit will just stop. You, you'll hear it, it. It knows? Yeah, you can hear it. Like it just won't go anymore. And I found, this has been a recent experiment. I would not recommend this to anyone who's not <laughs> very experienced at tuning drums. Rental caution right here. <laughs> I found that that setting on this particular drill 
is the perfect high tuning for every drum. And it's different. Like a six lug drum, it's gonna be way lower than a 10 lug drum. But it, it's put every time I've done it, it's put that drum in its max perfect high tension. I have a template folder on my desktop that has the location, uh, an alias for the location of my template that I use. Mm -hmm. um, so what I do is, is anytime I need to make a template change right there on my desktop, I open that uh, alias, I delete the template that I'm currently using. Then one folder over is my template session. I open that up, make all the little changes, save it back into the thing. And I, I name my template drums. So that way, when I open a new session, I type the title of the song first. So if it's, you know, Wiener Kill or whatever, Wiener Kill drums. And then when I go to do my bounce, it, it grabs that, it copies it out of the file name, and then it deletes the S, types over, types rough. And so it's Wiener Drum rough or whatever. And then it copies that, but just it copies the drums portion of it. And so that way, when I do the export, then it does the file name for the, for the folder. So all the way back from my template is me trying to get it to where I'm not ever typing anything into anywhere. The only thing that I type is the title of the song the first time I make the session, and then I don't ever touch anything ever again. Man, I got to get on this train big time. I'm looking at researching today. That's crazy. <laughs> It's awesome. And Keyboard Maestro is like 50 bucks. I basically say going in, hey, look, I'm going to give you the bone dry recorded drum sounds. Mm -hmm. They're going to be high quality, mm -hmm. but the drums are going to sound like these drums sound in the room. Yep. I remember when I first started messing around with Pro Tools, whatever, you know, almost two decades ago, if yep. not more. And I remember with my buddy, Sean, uh, the first time I ever actually had mics placed in the room and the drum set was in a place in the room sonically where when I recorded them and listened back to what I recorded, it sounded like the drum sounded right. Like that was a big deal. Like right. to anyone just getting started with this, if anyone who happens to check this out, hasn't recorded drums before, like that's, job one like first of all learn how to accurately record what the drums sound like in a room the first thing i bought was the apollo xap okay and i was like all right that's all i need eight mics plenty mm -hmm. and then within like a day i was like oh geez <laughs> like then then i got so all i have is just the apollo and then i got the audience 880 okay Go i don't know that okay just another, the, yeah, eight channels. And then I have the twin as well. Okay. So eight, so eight, so I have 18 channels, just a ridiculous amount of microphones going on in here for, uh, uh, you know, wow, you somewhere. really did go crazy. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. But that's it. And then, and then like, and, and then I just bought it, you know, I, I feel like I'm just informed enough about microphones now where I can like be a part of the conversation, which is cool. Right. So now um, you can, yeah, right. You can stand it you know, whatever, after yeah. any gig and, and kind of understand what, when th people are throwing random numbers around, you're like, Oh, yeah, I know. oh God. Like that was, that was my worst nightmare. <laughs> like my worst nightmare. Like I'll talk about Megadeth and Metallica all day, but then like, you know, as soon as like any, anyone starts to talk about microphones, I was always the first guy leaving. And now I kind of like, you know, I like it. At the end of the day, I might think something like, how can you not do this? This is the best way to treat this part of the tune mm -hmm. for me but not necessarily for them. And they may not hear it that way at all. And, right. and it might be like, oh, I can't believe I'm losing this, what I think is a great idea and the perfect scenario for this thing because they don't like this thing. But it's okay. It's, yeah. it's, we're, we're, just, we're just working together. It's like having a conversation and, and coming out like, okay, well, I may not agree with you, but I respect, I respect that that's how you feel about it and that's great, you know? It's a thing called a MIDI fighter twister and it's like a 16 button rotary encoder thing. Okay. And that's just, uh, you, you just can, you can, you can buy it and you won't have any regrets. It's just an amazing thing. It's also, you can push it, you can turn it. Uh, you can have, add your own colors to it, like LED colors. Do you have one sitting near you? Uh, yeah, well, I can take it off my board. Wait, so it's this thing. Oh, yes. Oh, look at that. 
<laughs> but I can't wait to show the guys in the band that I'm actually. <laughs> they're, gonna, uh, they're gonna love it. Why do uh, they think it's janky as shit or something? Or like... no, no, no. The, the <laughs> thing is, like, it, it's with all the colors. The okay. thing is, it's it's a genuinely, genuinely uh, uh, fantastic device. But the only thing is that we like it, we've all like everyone has one. Oh, because, I see. Okay. And that's like a particular band where uh, it's very much uh, like it's electronic music. So there needs to be a lot of flexibility. Yep. Um, but this thing is just, it's, it's the shit. But we, we've said it so many times, it's become a running gag. But um, I can advise anyone, <laughs> anyone getting, you know, dabbling in music production, <laughs> get okay. one of these. Yeah, it's just, it's just uh, Neumann KM, what is it, KM184? Yeah. KL, okay. KM. KM. Yeah, KM one eighty four. That's uh, and I did. I talked with a lot of people mm -hmm. about what to get, and mm -hmm. and for the the money. Yeah, those are for recording percussion. Those are really really spot on. Like yeah. you could get chefs, or you can go. But even then, it's like, well, is the the the, the fact that it's double the money are you going to hear it or is it is it really going to change the difference and I, and probably at some point i will get more uh, different options sure but uh money is going more, again, toward, more, more toward instruments at this point a variety of sound right yeah right i i i think that it more like if something comes back it's more about hey do you have a different kind of instrument more so than hey you know, instead of yeah, blowing right. overheads, can what you change? That microphone? Yeah, right. I think nowadays, as long as your 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 raw files are recorded well, great pre's, great mics, great great source source tones. I mean, really, that's the name of the game. That's it. That your your job is done. There's yeah. there's, there's very else, rare. Everything else is icing, really. Yeah, I mean, I find, you know. I don't know if you've ever been asked to do this, but it's only, I've only been asked, I think, in two decades, one time when someone called and said, hey, um, when you do this drum track, can you, can you, do you do Beat Detective? <laughs> like, what? <laughs> like, <laughs> I just take pride in the fact that knowing that I'm the same height as Stallone and, and, and Cruz, you know, I just hang on to that. I mean, uh, yeah. Um, it's not the it's not the it's not your height that we're talking about here. That's no, it, no, no, right? no, 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 no. <laughs> what are we talking about, buddy? Oh my god! I don't know. You store you took it off course, dude. I don't know. You know. I totally did. Um, oh, a lot <laughs> demo of demo sessions. sessions. Yeah. So demo <laughs> sessions. You know, and 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 everybody starts doing that. You know, and then now, so I think if anything that, of that that still kind of exists, like Jerry does a lot of that. Miles McPherson does that. You know, Dennis Holt. There's a lot of guys in town that do that. And I did that for like an eight year period where I would do three of those a day oh, where the kit's set up right. at one studio and then you go, there's another kid at the, and then they piggyback the other kit and you could do, I had a great period of time where it was like doing a lot of that. And I think my record was one day I did 21 songs in nine hours. So that's a lot of times hearing the song and then wow. they're, you're, you're getting that first take. So right. you really have to have a, a strong intuition about song structure and what is acceptable and what makes a radio hit. And right. So much of the stuff that I initially started doing and still is probably more of my work that I do here are people from elsewhere, either relationships I developed before I was here um, or people who sort of cold called or emailed with some tracks and then those relationships wind up developing, you know, if it's a producer or whatever, um, they keep rehiring you for stuff, especially once you get, as I'm sure you know, a rapport with people, even if you've never worked on the same room together after, after a couple few things you do for them, they understand how you work, you understand how they work and it becomes easier and then you just get regular calls on those. Right. You know? Right. Um, but but generally speaking, then and even now, I would say more of the work I do in this space are people that are not in Nashville. That studio you had with Vince and Dave, I don't know what the name of it was. It was the upstairs one. Yeah. So I, lo I always loved that room. It was like a small Me too. wood floor that was like yeah. sounded really good. It sounded great in there. And it's funny because that ceiling wasn't very high, really, but right. it still sounded really great in there. Yeah. 
I think like a lot of things, and you know this too, it's like you have to play for the room you're in, right? And how you hit, how you're going to hit the symbols is going to be different. And you just figure that out. That's part of like the things that uh, get instilled in you over years and years of playing. It's like, oh, this, I ha- what, what is the capabilities of this room? Should I be uh, playing louder? Should I be playing lighter? Like things you figure out, you know? And sometimes, you know how sometimes like you, you do something and you sonically, you think it's just amazing. And then you hear the mix. It's like a certain mic and a room you put up that you just, it's like Chad Blake or whatever. And you just think drums sound amazing. And then the artist sends it to you and that mic is pulled out and you're like, okay, all right. It's your record. Right. Right. That was the thing. <laughs> that was yeah. the thing that made this amazing. Exactly. That's the greatest thing about the technology of now is that somebody can dial you in on another part of the world and go, yeah. man, I heard you. Uh, you know, the latest video you posted, you did this thing. I don't know how to do that. Right. Can I get an hour lesson with you on zoom and you can show me how I get that drum sound or play this thing or, or whatever. When, when I was, man, we didn't know how anything was done. <laughs> it was like... I mean, that's, that's the whole thing. That's what I'm, I'm amazed at like where we're at. You know, like like all of us as drummers slash engineers, producers, whatever. It's like I didn't fucking there was you know, I had one I had like a, a Dennis Chambers video and a Dave Weckel video and that was that was it. You know what I mean? It was like you know And you had to you had to buy a VG, uh, VHS and you know, you're trying to like you couldn't slow shit down unless you had one of those fancy VCRs that had a pitch wheel on it, you know. But yeah. even with that, um it was amazing to that, you know, when Jeff's video came out, it was like, God, there it is. There's the Rosanna shuffle. He's fucking breaking it down. And <laughs> yeah. Yeah. and now that's all such a given. That Levon you know? Helm video is one of my favorites, man. Oh, dude. You you're, know? Like, you're like, what the fuck is, how does, <laughs> like, you, you watch it and you're still like, like, how is that coming out of this cat, man? Like, you know what I mean? It's uh, like, oh. What I man, and I think what's always funny, man, too, is like the Levon thing is so great because people are like, yeah, you know, and do like a, it's like a, you know, like a, like an underplayed, like a Levon thing. I'm like, what? <laughs> what are you? Right. I'm like, have you, have you seen the last waltz? Right. Go, go watch the version of, of, uh, you know, the night they old, they drove old Dixie down. You let me know how fucking underplayed that is, man. Yeah. I think the greatest drum mic ever invented is the Joseph Sydney 22. And uh, yeah, I've got those here. My prized possessions on Tom's. It's okay. just whenever I hear them, they're perfect. Mm-hmm. Uh, I get it if you're not using them for for everything because they are so like well-rounded and bright and clear sounding. But mm-hmm. that kind of changed everything, getting those. Also, uh, I really love the SCRN 17s for overheads. Like, oh yeah, okay. As far as really great usable like small diaphragms go, yeah, it's hard to get away from them uh, in my untreated room. I taught this class for Peabody, um, a recording class, and we did it all over online using audio mo- audio movers, audio movers, whatever yeah. that plugin audio is. Audio movers, yep. So we were talking about mic tuning and and drum tuning and and mic choice so i was like let me let me use your ears mic tuning mic tuning yeah i was like let me use your ears to help me decide if this bottom mic really makes a difference okay so they were having it cranking through their million dollar monitors and everything so i did just the top mic which was the sennheiser e904 whatever that is the clip on okay and then i plugged in a same mic into that cable on the bottom I really couldn't hear it on my end, but they were like, oh, yeah, absolutely. There's just so much more sound coming out. You mean, you mean only a bottom mic? No, both. The combination. Okay. okay. Yeah, the top only. They were like, yeah, it sounds great. I put the bottom on. And they're like, oh, yeah, there's just so much more to work with there. So much more low end and, and tone. Okay. 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 <clears throat> so I wouldn't do it if I didn't have those cables, though. There's no way in hell I would be running another line. 
It's what, a first head bottom. Are those, mic. are those the mics you're using at home on the bottom? Uh, what am I doing currently? I have the Sennheiser 904s on top, and I have the SE V Beats on the bottom. Similar clip on dynamic mic. You're making me think. That that cable thing, that's really intriguing to me. Yeah, unfortunately, I don't. I bought them off a friend. I don't know how he got them. So I don't know right. who. Like, I can't find them commercially available. I guess it's easy enough to splice a cable, but. Yeah, and but, you know, I, I do feel like now that I've been doing this more and, and more full time, I'm and especially recording my own dumb ass at home. Um, I get to stretch, you know, I, I, I don't have to play a stock fill because I know I'm not worried about getting this in one pass. I'm not worried about impressing someone or keeping up pace. Um, so I'll, I, I, I push myself a lot now because this is the only opportunity that I have to do so. Cause I will not practice. I, there's no fucking way in hell you can get me to sit down and play drums without a band. Um, it's just not possible. Do you feel uh, like those things that you may stretch for survive in the tracks? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And then, then it, uh, I, I, I mean, I, I notice it immediately because I'll use a fill that I've never used before that took me a minute to kind of like mm. craft or whatever. And then it'll become my default fill when I head into an actual studio. Um, I'll, I'll start leaning on those things more. And so it's the only way that I've been able to kind of evolve um, you know, which it, I, I don't know that I'm really moving the needle that anyone else can notice, but to me, at least I feel like I'm growing and I'm not just relying on the same old shit. And, you know, also I, if there's something pocket wise, uh, that becomes, you know, I, 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 because, you know, when you're in the studio, you have to be your own worst critic. You have to, you have to remember where you fucked up to call for punches and you have to catalog all of those dumb little things. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I try and look for patterns in that. Um, like I noticed the other day that there's a, a hi hat thing that I'll do in verses um, that is never as clean as it needs to be. And so the next time I go to do it, I make sure that I do it right. So he basically said to me at that point, he said, listen, man, you should turn this room into a place where you can record your drums because that's because in his that's where everything is going. Yeah. Right. Okay. And this is like 20 years ago, literally 20 years ago. And it's obviously he was prophetic because that's absolutely the case. Yeah. Home recording is definitely where things have gone for in, in, in great part. So at his, you know, sort of uh, encouragement, I said, OK, I think he's probably right. You know, he basically said, look, you're probably not going to buy your home in Malibu, but it'll always be a little source of income. There'll always be someone, Hey, can you play on this track? Can you play on that track here and there? Yep. And you know, I always tell people it's like a lot of the time, if you call me and you happen to catch me on a day where I'm just like in my pajamas, eating Captain Crunch, watching cartoons. And it's like, you have a couple of bucks for me to pop out here and do something for an hour. Right. Absolutely. And if I didn't have the space, I couldn't. Yeah. Before this was a studio, this was Kate's office. Oh, and nice. I had, I was in like a, like right when that pandemic started, I had a, a total guitar phase and I bought a couple half stacks. I had two half stacks in here. I had a, a Marshall JCM 800 for this pack. And then I had this EVH 5150. Wow. Like I, I was like, I was going, I even, I bought a Piaggio Vespa uh, scooter. I was like, I was, I was going, this was all pre buying a, a 57 microphone. You know? right, right. I had no microphones. Right. Just doing anything to avoid the inevitable. So how do how do the unions how are they dealing with um, like home home session world and things like that or and and subsequently how do you deal with it? Yeah. Now? Well, uh, I, without getting myself into too much trouble here, um, the union actually did a good job of coming up with a scale that was like a single song rate type deal. So. Um, and it was very easy because you have to, in order to build through the union, you have to be a signatory and blah, blah, blah. And that used to be a whole thing. They simplified all that down. So anybody could be that. Then, then when you're getting paid, you're also, they're also paying into the health and welfare and, and all that sort of stuff that comes with the union. Um, however, th- there are times when it's just, 
this song isn't going to be anything like this is whatever it's going to be. And I am comfortable sort of skating through it and just getting paid for the song and not going through the union, you know, and that's frowned upon. I mean, we're in Tennessee. It's a right to work state. It's not like it's illegal to do that, but, and, and I mean, trust me, I can only say good things about the union in general, because I have been fortunate to have been on recordings where the union really showed just how much better it was for me than if it hadn't gone through a union, you know? Um, That's the thing Ableton does quite easy as well, because the algorithm for uh, pitch shifting is is very fast. And if you find the right algorithm, you have a couple of ones you can choose from and they sound very good. Uh Um, It's just getting one more, if you uh, like, uh, say you have like kick snare overhead and a room mic, and then when you take the room mic and uh, transpose that an octave down, Mm. So it, it is. You can just hear it's like the same sound family because like every transient is on the, in the spot where it should be, or like every hit. But you can hear there's something sort of off. Mm-hmm. But also it adds like a like a shitload of vibe to it. It's just yeah. amazing. Yeah, um, especially like a symbol. Like you pitch a symbol down an octave. Like there you go. Yeah. <laughs> there, yeah. There's yeah. things going on in the background, but like, and that, it really is, it's, it's, it's a, it's a different kind of glue than uh, limiting or compressing or distorting would do, but it's, right. it's also, it's also glue. I don't know. Uh, I kind of like that kind of uh, thing as well. Yeah. And majority of orchestra musicians are like, oh, you have to have this super dark old case for Piatti and oh, you have to have this snare drum with super dry cable snares and everything. Because that is going to pierce through it, and that's the sound. But when you record, when you deal with the microphone and the room and all that stuff, and even the purpose of the music, it's it's a completely different different animal. Mm-hmm. So to understand why specific type of snare sound, snare drum sounds great, or or why specific cymbals sound great, or bass drum sound great, and and you know, you might even if it says fortissimo on bass drum, you might have to play. It it's a piano because you get the low end according to the section oh right of 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 course yeah all those things according to the section right of the room according to yeah not necessarily hitting the shit out of something right you, you're just gonna down. you're just gonna choke and it go, it's gonna bleed through every mic and then they're they're screwed later i'm trying i'm gonna try not to exaggerate but i remember uh when they were setting up the rows of room mics, yeah. you know, uh, in the room, there was a close room, mid, far. Uh, there was one above, there was a stereo overhead, like a, like a, a vintage um, broadcast where you would have to twist, you know, you twist a capsule to, to yeah. Uh, and I remember saying, I, looking up at it, and, and I could tell that it was an old, you know, it was a, a vintage mic. And I said, huh, you know, I'm just curious, what's that mic worth? And, and the engineer is just wiring shit. He just says, yeah, I don't really, I don't really know how much that's worth. I can just tell you the last offer we got that he turned down was up around a hundred grand. <laughs> what's it like? Well, look, you know, you can buy a uh let's fall for a hundred grand why right, it right. makes it makes it makes sense it's just so bizarre but anyways like i had fats on all the toms including snare shell like ju- just the close mics on that kit wow it, it, I, in the room just for drums right. i don't I, I can't i don't even know Clearly, if I include that mic above me, you know, you're looking at a hundred. <laughs> you're looking at one hundred fifty thousand dollars easily. Microphones. How did so, you play? how did you play after that? You play okay? Oh, way better. You play yeah, way okay. better. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why dr- some dr- demo musicians, you know, and there's not there's that line that is not in the sand anymore. Like Nashville in the '90s was like, you're a road musician, or you're a demo guy, or you play on master recordings, or you know. Um, now there's like everybody does everything and everybody has to be a master of all right. just to just to survive. Right. But I think th- the demo musicians from back in the day were some of the greatest musicians because you only have 35 minutes per song from hearing it to, yeah. to the finished product. So you totally have to rely on your gut and be able to take direction, but at the same time be so strong in your concepts and desires and, and musical uh ideas and just be able to commit 
in that moment. Do you do you feel like because of all this recording with Jason that and, and that that basically that time period that you're kind of used to that yeah. has kind of like strengthened your gut intuition about like what the right thing is and you, you know, not to say that yeah. you're not open, but you're kind of like I'm pretty sure this is the right thing, you know? Yeah. Totally. I think I think that you know it's it's uh it's time in the trenches, you know, it's a, you know, those 10,000 hours so God knows how many thousands of about tens of thousands of hours you and I have, not only from working on the craft, but applying the craft. But but within recording, uh, I think it did uh, give me a concept of uh, trying to mix the kit as an instrument as a as it is. Yes, it's right. a bunch of components, but one dude's playing it as an instrument, you know, right. as a voice. Right. So make that sound balance the way you want it to come across. Um, uh, especially I think once I discovered that, uh, again, in that time, there wasn't as much, nearly as much manipulation as you can do now. So right. if, if you wanted it to sound balanced, you kind of, you didn't totally have to play it that way. Yes. You could goose certain things and make things, whatever you could do some fixes, but the less you fix, the better off you are. That's the thing I learned too. Like the the yeah. better the signal going in is, the better off you'll be. Right. And so not only does that apply to tone and touch and all that, it applies to the kit as a whole. And then you do other stuff uh, where I just sent tracks to Chris Lord Algae and he was like, oh man, he's like, don't put the compressor on the on your room mics. He's like, I want to be able to do that. So it's like, oh shit, I, you know, I messed that up. But Right. You know, and, but it's like knowing the difference of like, which guy you're going to send stuff to. Is it, is, is it somebody mixing at home that wants you to have presented in a way that it's like, they can just throw it in their track and it's done. Or am I sending it to somebody that's a, a proper mixer that wants nothing on there. Right. Yeah. And I've had, I've had Joe mix tracks that have come out of here and I purposely went to the sessions when he was mixing just to be like, okay. Yeah. What, where am I blowing it and where am I not, you know? Yeah. And that's that's a pretty awesome experience to be able to go like, you know, uh, try to get some stamp of approval, but also obviously more about improving and learning 